Well, good morning again, church. Wow. All right. Let's do it. Okay. I'm ready. Um, If you you have your Bibles out, will you open up to the book of Ephesians? Um, When I fill in for Pastor Joshua, I don't typically continue on. It's very difficult to write a series and stay in a train of thought in a passage when someone else is kind of jumping in the middle of that. So uh, we're going to switch gears this morning to do something a little bit different. Um, While you're turning to the book of Ephesians, that's really where we're going to live this morning. So there won't be slides. You won't have to jump around in your Bible a bunch. Um, But while you're turning there, join me in praying. Father, as we look to your word this morning, as we consider the weighty and beautiful truths that you have revealed to us in your word, may it stir our hearts to greater hope, to deeper faith, to a more joyful praising of you. As we see your lavished grace, as we consider the realities of being hidden in Christ, I pray that we would bless your name this morning, that our hearts would be stirred to worship, that the things that are weighing us down in this world, the distractions of the day, the uh, wars, the, the concerns for a world that seems to be in chaos will be put aside, that our confident hope in you would be the reassurance we need this day to press forward, to continue on, to grow in Christ's likeness. And I pray, Lord, if there are those here this morning who have not turned from their sin and entrusted their life to Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would be changing hearts this morning, that your spirit would be bringing life to those who are dead in their sin for your glory, for their good. It is because of Christ that we can pray. Amen. Uh, When I was uh, considering what I might preach today, I I really struggled to land the plane, so to speak, on what might be most beneficial for you. Um, Given the circumstances of our world, the uh, chaos that ensues when man's sin is given full vent, there's much to be concerned about. Um, I can only assume that many of you are aware of the things that are going on and um, when the news feed and the social media pages are just constantly drowning in what is vile evilness, it can be overwhelming. Uh, It can tend to stir our hearts to worry or fear. And so I'd, I'd originally planned to preach a sermon focusing on the fear of the Lord versus the fear of man and the fear of the circumstances of the world. But uh, through prayer and consideration, as I, as I wrestled with these options, um, I ended up here in Ephesians to focus our time on the magnificent grace of the blessed blesser. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. I plan to work through this passage as it flows. There are um, 
a multitude of key points in the text, uh, and we may not hit on all of them in uh, great or deep ways. Uh, that would take weeks to do that in, in a uh, sermon, but my hope for you this morning is that you will see the grace of God and the abundant blessings you have in Christ. If I can magnify your view of the glory of God this morning, then I will have accomplished the goal that Paul, in his writing to the churches here in Asia, was attempting to accomplish. So let's begin with verse 3, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How can we bless the God of all things? He is lacking in nothing. His perfection is infinite. He is infinitely blessed, perfectly blessed. A handful of Spurgeon quotes, if you know me, you know uh, he's one of my favorites. Spurgeon says, but how can we bless God? Without doubt, the less is blessed of the greater. Can the greater be blessed by the less? Yes, but it must be in a modified sense. God blesses us with all spiritual blessings, but we cannot give him any blessings. He needs nothing at our hand, and if he did, we could not give it. If I were hungry, saith the Lord, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. God has an all-sufficiency within himself and can never be thought of as dependent upon his creatures or as receiving anything from his creatures which he needs to receive. He is infinitely blessed already. We cannot add to his blessedness. When he blesses us, he gives us a blessedness that we never had before. But when we bless him, we cannot by one iota increase his absolutely infinite perfectness. David said to the Lord, my goodness extends not to you. This was as if he said, let me be as holy, as devout, as earnest as I may. I can do nothing for thee. Thou art too high, too holy, too great for me to be really able to to bless thee in the sense which you do bless me. This point is very important. It would be a great miss to think that God needed us for any of his perfection. In fact, the reality that God is altogether sufficient within himself only serves to display in a, a magnified way the amazing grace of God that he would stoop down to bless us his creation. In a very real sense, we cannot bless God in any way that would change God as if um, he is changeable. God is unchanging. We cannot add to his blessedness. He is self-sustaining, self-sufficient. He, he needs nothing outside of himself to exist and to be altogether glorious. All of his attributes are perfect lacking in nothing, including his blessedness. In contrast, we, his creation, are needy. Just to survive, we need food. We need water. We need relationship. And so forth. Above all of this, we need grace, church. Without it, we would be utterly hopeless. We are dependent God is independent. So how then do we bless God? Paul declares, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we, his creatures, bless him? Well, first, we do so from our hearts. Knowing that our deepest praise does not change God in any way, but it is instead a right honoring of who he is and who we are as his creation. Spurgeon says again, I, I should say first that this language is the expression of gratitude. We say with David, bless the Lord, O my soul, and we say with Paul, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We can bless God by praising him, extolling him, desiring all honor for him, ascribing all good to him, magnifying and lauding his holy name. Well, we do that. Sit still, if you will, and let your heart be silent unto God, for no language can ever express the gratitude that I trust we feel to him who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Praise him also in your speech. Break the silence. Speak of his glory. Invite others to cry out with you, Hallelujah, or praise to Jehovah. Ascribe you greatness unto our God. Oh, that all flesh would magnify the Lord with us. In the ways that God has created us, we can bless, so to speak, the Lord by ascribing all praise to him by thinking deeply of his glorious grace, by singing and praying and worshiping the Lord. We can bless the Lord by sharing the gospel, by making disciples, by joining him in his work of salvation that others may praise him along with us. We can bless the Lord when we agree with scripture about who he is. Spurgeon says, this language is also an utterance of assent to all the blessedness that is ascribed to the Lord. After hearing how great he is, how glorious he is, how happy he is, we bless him by saying, Amen, so let it be. So we would have it. He is none too great for us, none too blessed for us. Let him be great, glorious, and blessed beyond all conception. I think we bless God when we say concerning the whole of his character, Amen. This God is our God forever and ever. Let him be just what the Bible says he is. We accept him as such. Sternly just, he will not spare the guilty. Amen. Blessed be his name. Infinitely gracious, ready to forgive. Amen. So let it be. Everywhere present, always omniscient. Amen. So again, do we wish him to be. Everlastingly the same, unchanging in his truth, his promise, his nature, We again say that we are glad of it, and we bless him. He is just such a God as we love. He is indeed God to us because he is really God, and we can see that he is so. And every attribute ascribed to him is a fresh proof to us that Jehovah is Lord. Thus, we bless him by adoration. Church, when we read God's word, when we see the truths revealed to us in his word, Do we say yes and amen? I realize we may do that when it comes to his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy. But do we do it the same when it comes to his wrath, his judgment, his righteousness? We ought to praise him for the fullness of who he is as revealed in his truth. We would not worship a God who is only grace. That is the God that the world has created. We know this because when we meet injustice, we long for it to be corrected. If God were not just and did not pour out wrath for the wicked, we would not worship him. He would not be a God worthy of worship. On the flip side of this, if God were only wrath, we would have no hope, no joy in our worship of him. But praise be to God, church, He is both just and the justifier. Finally, we bless God when we care for his people. When we visit the sick, when we prepare meals for those in difficult times, when we pray with our family for healing and provision, when we counsel, when we disciple the immature to maturity, in all the ways that we practice the one another's, we bless the Lord. And again, this is merely our praise of him. It is not an increasing of God in his perfect blessedness. Now let's consider the second part of our verse this morning, Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Church, Christian, do you believe that you have been blessed in Christ 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Are you struggling today? In the here and now, are you weighed down? Take heart. Our God and Father has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. If you are in Christ, you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. You have been blessed beyond comprehension, not just eternally, though that in and of itself would be more than we could ever imagine. But you are blessed right now. Uh, As an elder, we get a unique insight to the lives of our church family. Knowing our family here, I understand that many of you are dealing with weighty realities that are unavoidable in a fallen world. Some of these realities are a result of our own sin. Some are a result of other sin or the result of a world corrupted by sin. However, what we must remember for those who are in Christ, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means that even in our own failures and sin, Though there may be consequences, we are forgiven and saved, hidden in Christ, hidden in the cleft of the rock of the ages. Spurgeon says he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ, a new heart, a tender conscience, a submissive will, faith, hope, love, patience. We have all these in Christ. Regeneration, Justification, adoption, sanctification, perfection are all in Christ. If we do not take them out, it is the fault of our palsied hand that has not strength enough to grasp them. But he has given us all spiritual blessings in Christ. Whenever you read your Bible and see a great promise, do not hesitate to claim it. He hath given us all spiritual blessings in Christ. I am afraid, says one, that I should be presuming if I took some of the promises. He hath given us all spiritual blessings in Christ. You are in your father's house. You cannot steal. For your father says, help yourself to what you like. He has made over his whole estate of spiritual wealth to every believing child of his. Wholehearted, sorry, wherefore take freely, and you will by doing so glorify God. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. With all the blessings, church, that we receive from God the Father in Christ, this is the greatest. We get Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are hidden in Christ. We are covered by his perfect life redeemed by his sacrificial death, sustained by his word, which right now upholds the universe. We get Jesus, our Lord, our King. We get the example of how to live in the example of his life. We get the joy of striving to grow in Christ's likeness because we are freed from having to earn anything which we could never earn in the first place. We get to worship our wonderful Savior in spirit and in truth. We get to have an intercessor who pleads on our behalf to the Father. We get access to the Father through Christ Jesus the Son. And one day, church, one great and glorious day, we will get to throw our crowns at his feet when finally we are face to face with our Lord with our King. Church, do you see the amazing blessing you have in having Christ Jesus? I was tempted to just stay here on this verse for our entire time this morning, to expound upon the magnitude and beauty of Christ and our being hidden in Him would easily be sufficient to fill our time. However, I hope that by moving on in our text, we will get to see other ways 
that we are blessed. And these would also be kindling for the fire of your souls to bless God the Father in all his wondrous grace. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to to the purpose of his will. Church, blessed be God the Father. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He has chosen us in Christ to be his sons and daughters even before the foundation of the world was set. It was God's holy will that he should choose a people owing nothing to them, not obligated to give salvation, not responding to what man did in his salvation, but before they were, before we had done anything good or bad, God chose to redeem a specific people according to his perfect and holy will. If God has granted you repentance and faith, He planned to do it before time began. He chose you out of his creation to be redeemed by the blood of his incarnate Son. God, who is perfect in wisdom and love, chose to do this on his own will, even to do it at such a great cost to him and to his Son. Remember this, Christian. God did not have to create. As the only self-sufficient being to exist, he did not and does not need anything. He's not lacking. That's what it means that he is perfect. Under no obligation, the one true God chose not only to create, but to save from his creation a people for himself adopted sons and daughters through the finished work of Christ. He did not have to make a people who would be rebellious and therefore need to send his son into creation to die in their place. But it was his will to do so. Church, this news should floor us. It should cause us to wonder at God's infinite wisdom and grace. This is not the way we would have done it. Praise God, he is the creator and we are the created. Praise God that he does not think like us or act like us. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They are much, much higher than ours. In his perfect wisdom, he chose to elect a people from his creation to be redeemed. He chose, along with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, to have the eternal Son, take on a human nature at the incarnation to do all that God required of us so that Christ Jesus would be the perfect substitute to redeem us through his sacrificial death and glorious resurrection. God planned before creation all of what would be necessary to bless us in Christ. Doing this according to his holy will alone ensures that we can never take credit nor be puffed up towards others when it comes to our salvation and truly, for that matter, when it comes to anything else. If not for God's eternal plan, Christian, you would remain dead in your sin and so would I. We are only who we are because God chose before the foundation of the world to redeem us and to give us faith through the high cost of his son. If this does not cause your heart to well up with worship, I don't know what will. Oh, when we cry out with Paul, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Christian, it was always God's plan to rescue you from your sin through the costly blood of Christ. It was his will, his desire, his plan. He did this so you and I and all whom he saves would be holy and blameless before him as sons and daughters. This holy and blameless point may be difficult to embrace, but it should not be difficult to understand. We are in a already but not yet stage of this reality. We who have been saved are indeed hidden in Christ, yet we remain in this fallen world with the old self and sin constantly in battle against God and his righteousness. We do not feel holy and blameless because in the here and now, in and of ourselves, we are not yet holy and blameless in the fullness of the sense. On the other side of that coin, because we are hidden in Christ, who is holy and blameless, we are seen as holy and blameless through Christ. In this life, we are at war with our old selves and sin. We are not perfect. Being hidden in Christ, the Father sees the holiness and blamelessness of his Son when he considers us. So I understand how it's hard to embrace the reality of being made holy and blameless, We are in this life being sanctified. We are growing in holiness. We are growing in blamelessness. But we have not and will not reach it fully until we are glorified by God. However, while we wait, Christian, we remain hidden in Christ. And he is holy and blameless. When we rightly understand this reality, it should cause us to say again with Paul, blessed be God the Father who has blessed us in Christ. Spurgeon said, we have to bless God that all his gifts come to us in Christ. Notice Paul's words, according as he hath chosen us in him. God called us in Christ He justified us in Christ. He sanctified us in Christ. He will perfect us in Christ. He will glorify us in Christ. We have everything in Christ, and we have nothing apart from Christ. Let us praise and bless the name of the Lord that this sacred channel of his grace is as glorious as the grace itself. There is as much grace in the gift of Christ to save us as there is in the salvation of which Christ has wrought out for us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, you and I were predestined to be reformed, redeemed, sorry, by God before time began. If God has set out to do something, there is nothing, and I mean nothing, that can thwart his will. No one can stop him. No will of man can overcome the will of God. He decided to rescue us and adopt us into his eternal family through the gospel of grace. It is God's desire to make us holy and blameless before him. In this life, we grow in our sanctification as believers. We, we grow more and more holy, more and more blameless because God is at work in us. However, in this life, we will not be made perfect. Praise God for that, church, because we love the grace of Christ. If you could be made perfect, you would not need that. I don't want to be made perfect. I want the grace of Christ. We will in this life always have some remaining sin. We must be at war against it. But we must not forget that Christ Jesus is who we are hidden in, even now. And on that day when we stand before the judgment, who we will remain hidden in. When we give an account to the Lord for all of our sin, our account will simply be the blood of Christ. He paid it all. He covers us. He is our righteousness. What about this sin? Christ. What about this one? Christ. It's all him. He's the only reason I can be here before you. It is Christ and Christ alone. We will be covered By Christ, hidden in Christ, he will be our righteousness. He will be our perfection. 
We will be holy and blameless because the Father will see his Son in whom we will be hidden. There will be a sweet day in our futures where we will no longer sin, where we will have glorified bodies and be in the presence of our Lord. But until that day comes, Christian, remember who you are hidden in. Remember the overwhelming joy of being in Christ Jesus our Lord because of the eternal plan of God to rescue us. Lastly, do not miss this clear point. It is in love that God the Father predestined us to salvation in his Son. God chose to place his great love upon us according to his own sovereign will alone, not because of you, what you might do, how you might so-called respond He did it in such a way that it was fully dependent upon his will to choose. To choose to love you, to choose to redeem you, to choose to send his son to die for your sin. God chose to love us whom he would save because he desired to do so. The way in which he loved us was this. He sent his son to die for us so that we could be saved by Christ so that we could be found hidden in Christ. God did this for you, Christian, out of his love for you through his lavishing grace by the work of his one and only son. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. Church, God did all of this to the praise of his glorious grace. It is his glorious grace that he has blessed us, those whom he has saved, in the beloved, namely Christ Jesus himself. How can we not praise his glorious grace when we hear these truths, church? God redeemed a people unto himself through Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. Grace. It is in this glorious grace that the blessed one is the blesser of his creation. We cry out, Blessed be God, because in his grace he has blessed us in Christ. If you've forgotten this, church, let this reminder renew your downcast soul. We are blessed by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. God pours out his grace like an overwhelming flood upon your souls in your redemption and union to Christ. We are his bride. He is the bridegroom. We are united to him in such an intimate and unique way that the scripture uses the marriage covenant to help us grasp this reality. Scripture actually helps us see that marriage was created and given to us by God to help us understand this eternal marriage covenant to Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are, as believers, adopted to be sons and daughters of God the Father. Do you know what it means to be a son and daughter of the Father? We are heirs of God's entire creation. We are, we are co-heirs with Christ. How can that be? The one and only Son, and yet you and I are co-heirs through his blood, church. Oh, how we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Christian. All because of Christ, all to the praise of of his glorious grace. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In him, meaning Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us 
in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have redemption. You are redeemed in Christ. You are no longer condemned. You no longer have the penalty that you owe a righteous, holy God for your sin. It has been redeemed. Your brother has paid for it. Your Lord, your Savior, your King has paid for it with his blood. If you are here this morning and you do not understand this, if this does not apply to you, if you are still remaining in your sin, if you have not turned away from sin and turned to Christ Jesus as your Lord in faith, then please lean in and listen to me closely. All mankind has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God, being perfectly just, has required the penalty of death for sin. Before you ask if that seems just, let me just remind you that you are not fit to make that decision because you and I are fallible men and women. We are not in the place of judging the Lord. If God declared it to be just, it is indeed just. We have not only sinned, but we are enslaved to sin. Our hearts being dead in sin only desire to sin. You may not be the worst sinner you can possibly be because God in his mercy restrains sinners. However, all that you can do apart from Christ is sin. In sin, apart from faith and repentance in Christ, all you can do is sin. You are hopelessly lost in your sin unless God shows up. Our perfect creator requires our undivided allegiance to him. However, when we are dead in our sin, we cannot give it because our hearts desire sin above all things. You will only do what your heart desires. In sin, everything you do, you do for yourself as if you are the one true God. The sin is of a much greater magnitude than you can truly grasp. This is why it cost the incarnate Son, Jesus, his life. Jesus was perfect. He never sinned in thought or action. He obeyed God's perfect and righteous commands without error. He then died the death that we as sinners deserve to die for our sin against God. God poured the wrath he had stored up for sinners upon Christ. The only perfect man to ever live died the death all mankind deserve for their sin. Your only hope is to trust in the finished work of Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the only Savior. You see, your salvation is not dependent upon your good deeds. Praise the Lord. You could never earn God's favor through our failed and flawed attempts and efforts. If salvation was dependent upon us, no one would be saved. No one. You need God to intercede in your dead heart. He must grant you repentance and faith in Christ alone for salvation. He must remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a new heart with new desires. It is my earnest prayer, truly, if you are here today and have yet to turn from your sin to Christ Jesus as Lord, that today God would give you a new heart, cause you to repent and believe, and that you would leave here today praising his glorious grace with the rest of the brothers and sisters whom Christ died to save. I pray that you would leave here hidden in Christ and not dead in your sin. If you would but turn to Christ Jesus in faith, you will find a more than willing Savior of your soul. 
God's lavish grace would pour over your heart. You will not be met with rejection, but embrace. God the Son delights in saving his people from their sin. He is the good shepherd. He laid down his life for his sheep. Oh, that you would turn to him and be saved. I guarantee you will not find him lacking, sinner. He will be swift to pour his grace upon you and call you his own. If God saves you this morning, if you turn to him in repentance and faith, it will be because he, in the riches of his grace, has lavished his grace upon you and revealed to you the mystery of his will to redeem a people through his son. Christian, have you somehow forgotten this? Have you forgotten the beauty of the gospel? Have you forgotten the immense grace of God for you? Have you forgotten his perfect providence to carry out all that he intends, declaring the beginning from the end? The mystery of his will is that his son would take on a human nature to fulfill his law and be the perfect sacrifice to save his chosen people whom he chose before creation. God has lavished his grace upon us. He has blessed us in his lavishing grace. If his grace were a river, the world could not hold the water of it flowing over us in our salvation. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Notice something else. This eternal plan of God's was hidden to an extent for a long period of time. Those prior to Christ knew of the Savior to come. It's it's who they trusted in for salvation. It's how they were saved by faith in the Savior to come. But they did not get to see the fullness of God's plan in time. However, every prophecy in God's word has or will come true. Every prophetic utterance of Christ was proven in time by God in his sovereign providence to carry out his perfect plan of redemption, a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to Christ. Now, this plan is not yet fully completed. If it were, Christ would have returned and we, along with all the saints of the past, would be with him, united under him, under his kingship. However, what we can know, what God has proven to us over and over again, is that it will come to pass. God has declared it will, so it will. It is another promise to grab a hold of. One day all things will be united under Christ Jesus. Things in heaven and things on earth. One day we will worship with the saints of old and the elect angels, our Savior and King, together. All under King Jesus, our Lord. Christian, what an amazing day that will be. When we get to sing with the elect angels praises to our Lord, who can fathom that? And what I hope you see here is this. God has a plan for all things. In his plan, it is his perfect will that stands and ensures that his plan will come to pass. He planned before creation to redeem a people through his son, and he has and is doing this. Through thousands of years and millions of human lives, God orchestrated the birth, life, and sacrificial death of his son for his elect perfectly. He has proven to us time and again through his prophets that he will do what he has said 
he will do. If he declares to have a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to Christ, then he does indeed have this plan, and he will indeed make certain that it comes to pass. Isaiah 46, verses 8 through 11. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. You see, church, God did not wind this world up and let it go in hopes that things would turn out right. Oh, I hope I'll get to send my son. Oh, I hope I'll get to redeem. That language does not leave the mouth of God. He does not hope. He simply does. He is sovereign over all things. He is right now using wicked, evil, sinful men for his glorious purposes according to his will. What they meant for bad, God uses for good. The happenings of this world are wicked. Things have begun to really spin up these last few weeks. I don't know if I've ever in my life been closer to another world war. But fear not, Christian. Whom have you to fear? God is on the throne. His will cannot be thwarted. None can stay his hand. He will carry out all his perfect holy will and unite all things together under Christ. That was his eternal plan, and he will do it. Blessed be God, our Father, who has blessed us in Christ. He is the blessed blesser of men. We are undeserving recipients of his lavish grace. Oh, how I pray that this would stir your heart to greater worship and joy in your Lord. How I pray that you would cling to Christ in your coming days. I pray that the blessed Lord would be magnified in your heart, that that you would renew your hope in Christ even in the midst of fearful circumstances. Has he said it and will he not do it? God will accomplish all his purposes. He purposed to save you, Christian, to give you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And we have seen the salvation come to pass. Praise God. Trust God, church. He is sovereign over all nations and peoples. Oh, let the peoples rage and the nations plot in vain. Your Lord laughs from the heavens at them. His will will be done. His blessings shower down on us in his Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. Blessed be God indeed. Christ is our rock of ages. Christ is the cleft that we are hidden in, Christian. Christ is ours and Christians are his. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father now. All authority in heaven and on earth is his. God has blessed us in Christ and we can rest assured in his plan and sovereignty. Praise God for his amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, what do we say? How do we thank you? How can we bless you? You are perfectly blessed. Let our feeble attempts, Lord, be music to your ears. Let our fickle hearts turn to focus on you, to truly appreciate what you've done for us in Christ, to truly worship you out of an overflow of our hearts that you have changed forever. In the dark days and the confusing times and the (coughs) fearful things of this world, stir our hearts to remember you are sovereign. 
Nothing will come to pass apart from your will. Remind us who we are in Christ, hidden in him, and let us worship you. It is because of Christ that we can pray. Amen.